Well, hey, once again, I want to welcome you to church online today as we're jumping back in a message series. Uh, we started a few weeks ago entitled Life Hacks. Uh, Life Hacks, as we've been looking at some of the words of wisdom from this book of wisdom known as Proverbs. Uh, this book of the Bible that you need to know is about so much more than just a, a list of some good tips on how to live better but I believe reveals the tipping points when it comes to releasing God's blessing in our lives. Because as we touched on a, a couple weeks ago, especially if you're a believer in Jesus, how many know you're blessed? <laughs> you're, you're blessed. You don't have to get blessed. You've already been blessed. Uh, you've been blessed through this relationship with Jesus. Not only have you been blessed with a, with a new home when it comes to your eternity, but with a new purpose with new identity, with new direction, with a new future in Him. This promise that through this life we have in Him, we can walk with the confidence of knowing that our best days are never behind us, but they're always ahead of us, they're always in front of us. As Look, I want to share a message with you today. And really this life hack that we find in Proverbs chapter 4 on how to age well with time. How to age well with time. Anyone want to know how to age well as you grow older? Come on, if that's you, this is the Proverbs for your life, right? Let's take a look at this. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 10 through 15. It says, dear friend, take my advice. It will add years to your life. I'm writing out clear directions to wisdom way. I'm drawing a map to righteous road. I don't want you ending up in blind alleys or wasting time making wrong turns. Hold tight to the good advice. Don't relax your grip. Guard it well. Your life is at stake. And that love, verse 18, how it puts it. It says, the path of the righteous is like the morning sun shining ever brighter till the full light of day. As Look, I thought it'd be fun to kind of lead into where we're going with this message by playing a little game of guess who. Guess who is like, I'm going to put a picture up on the screen and we're going to see if you can figure out who this is a picture of. Now, quick clue, this is someone that I know very well. And so I'll give you a couple quick seconds here to guess who you think it is. Maybe put in the chat box. Maybe if you think it's my dad. You know, if you thought it was my dad, yeah, let me say, you're, you're close. You're, you're close. It looks a lot like my dad. But actually, it's a picture of me. A picture of me. As I found this phone app that will actually add years to your life. And so this is actually a picture of what I'm supposed to look like 20 years from now. 20 years from now. Uh, in fact, actually, I was having so much fun with this app. They actually have a filter. They have a cool filter uh, that will put a beard as well on your face and kind of give you a little bit more of a hip look. And so this is actually what I'm supposed to look like 20 years from now with the cool feature on. Take a look. Yeah. I, I I'm, I'm kind of digging that. I, I feel like I need to start growing out some facial hair. You know, he looks really familiar, too. Like, I've seen this guy before, right? And again, I, I was having a blast with this. In fact, I was spending way too much time on this phone app, so much so that I, I thought it'd be fun to uh, put it on my wife, a picture of my wife. Anyone want to know what Holly will look like 20 years from now? 20 years from now? Well, here's a, a recent picture of the two of us together. Take a look at this. And now here's a picture of her 20 years from now. Right? Like, isn't it amazing? Like she doesn't look a day older. Right? Like she isn't age at all. Talk about aging well with time, right? And look, I, I share those with you to uh, just kind of highlight this fact and really ask this question. And it's how many of you are excited about this? Excited about this. Not so much the picture and the beard and all that, but excited about what the picture represents excited about getting old. Now, if you're not just shooting your hand up in the air right now, look, I get it. I understand if you're uh, less than a little enthusiastic about this. Because let's be honest, getting older, it can be a challenge, right? It can be a challenge. Like I used to feel like I could do anything without getting hurt. And now I'm starting to enter that phase in my life where I can do nothing and still find a way to get hurt. Right? Anyone know what I'm talking about? Where, where you wake up hurting and all you did was sleep? <laughs> like I did the very thing that was meant to bring recovery and now I can't do the very things I tried to recover from. 
Because again, getting older can be a challenge, especially uh, living in a day and an age in a culture and society that I find often is so obsessed with trying to stay young, <laughs> uh, trying to look younger and feel younger. And I, I think a big reason for this is because somewhere along the way we've embedded and just sort of bought into uh, and accepted this idea that, that as we physically decline, all of life just tends to, to get a little bit more worse. <laughs> A little bit more worse for the wear because that's what we've been fed. But listen, here's why I love this passage in Proverbs 4. Because it reminds us of something I think we got to get if we hope to age well with time. And it's this, is that as you physically decline, you need to understand you are meant to become more spiritually alive. Come on, somebody. As you physically decline, you were meant to become more spiritually alive alive. Uh, like, like there's parts in your life that, that as you grow older, as you, you know, age, we're meant to, to be stretched and grown and matured. In fact, I love how it describes it in verse 18. It says, again, the path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Like, I really believe this, that as you get older, there's so many parts of our lives that were, they were meant to get better. They were meant to get better. They were meant to get stronger. They were, they were meant to get bolder. Like, that, that are meant to grow spiritually in here, even as our lives decline physically out there. Parts of you that were meant to come alive. Because let's be honest, you can fight aging as hard as you possibly can. But can we all agree at some point in time, I mean, you know, gravity is going to win. <laughs> At some point in time, gravity is going to win. But while our bodies may decline physically, that doesn't mean we have to fade spiritually. Because here's the thing. Is I find worse than a few more aches and pains as you get older with your body is growing more bitter as you age. Growing more unforgiving as you age. Growing more resentful as you age or more cynical as you age. Like you can hit the spa all day long. Take a little extra me time during your week and you can try as hard as you want. And yet if you're more vengeful and angry, that's not aging well. You can work out every day. You can hit the gym. You can do cardio. But if you're cursing people out as you're pulling out of the church parking lot, can we all agree that's not a good look? That's not a good look. And so how do we age well with time? Well, I think we start to get a glimpse into the answer through this passage in Proverbs 4. Let's take a look at it again. It says, I'm writing out clear directions to wisdom way. Uh, what's Solomon getting at here? Well, he's talking about the way in which, which, which we grow most in here. And learn to thrive in here by referencing this biblical process for growth that the Bible oftentimes refers to as discipleship. As discipleship. See, when Solomon wrote these, these Proverbs, they weren't meant to be shared within the context of a classroom. As much as in the context of relationship. Of doing life together, doing life with someone else. It's the very word discipleship in Hebrew it literally means apprenticeship. Uh, to be an apprentice, as, as stick with me on this, but to really understand the biblical concept of discipleship, this way of wisdom that Solomon's referring to here, uh, you got to understand that at the time, there were really two schools of thought when it came to learning. Uh, there was the uh, kind of Greek school of thought, the Greek school thought when it came to education and growth and learning and development, where uh, they simply saw learning through the lens of, of knowledge acquisition. And so they felt like that happened best within a classroom setting. But in Solomon's day, there was another school of thought, and this was the Hebrew school of thought, uh, where they, they saw learning not as something that was simply confined to a classroom. And so where the Greek school of thought was focused on the philosophical, the Hebrew school of thought was about focusing on the spiritual and the practical. And so while, yeah, there was a heavy focus on, on learning the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, of the, of the Old Testament and, and growing in their knowledge of the truth of God's word. Discipleship is really what took it beyond just the classroom. Understanding 
that when it comes especially to the truth of God's word, I mean, you know, sometimes you can't just know how true something is until you've been through some things. Come on, somebody. Until, until you've been through some life, until you've been through some challenges, until you've been through, through, through some circumstances and situations. Like sometimes it's only after you've been through a failure or been through a heartbreak that you discover just how true his grace is. <laughs> that you discover just how true his mercy is. That you discover just how true his comfort and his presence is. That you discover just how true the gospel message is. Of God's unyielding forgiveness and mercy and heart and love for you and for me. See, see, sometimes you gotta go through some things, you gotta go through some life to discover just how true something is. Because uh, for sort of the goal for the Hebrew school of thought was not just to teach you wisdom, but ultimately discernment as well. Understanding something about our lives that I think we can so often miss. And that is this, is that whether you realize it or not, you and I are always being discipled. You are always being discipled. Like the question is not, will you be discipled? But what will you be discipled into? (laughs) Right? Like what kind of person will you become? Like sometimes I can kind of tell um, you know, what shows my boy is really into or what he's watching just simply by his response and some of the words that come out of his mouth. Like, because the reality is he's being discipled by what he watches. He's being discipled by what he watches. And can I tell you something? So are you. <laughs> like, if you've got that, that little Fox News logo burned into the corner of your screen, you need to know that you are being discipled. And by the way, I'm an equal offender this morning. If you've got that little CNN logo burned at the bottom of your screen, you are being discipled. See, how you wake up disciples you. Uh, the, the relationships that you have disciples you. Uh, that, that what you invest your time in and your focus in is leading you somewhere. And if that somewhere is more fear and more anxiety and more doubt... Maybe, just maybe, it's time to reevaluate what you're allowing to disciple and shape and influence and direct your life. Uh, Like if you wake up every day with Scripture versus Facebook, go to bed at night with prayer versus social media, listen, I'm just telling you, I I promise you, your perspective, your outlook is going to be radically different. Uh, Again, we're always being discipled into something. The, The question is what? In fact, I like how Paul kind of speaks into this tension at play within our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 or 7, he says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, no, we declare God's wisdom. God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Again, there's a a wisdom of this world and a wisdom from God that are not always one and the same. And again, this is why discernment is so important, as maybe it will help to explain it like this, is that there are some times and there are some problems and there are some issues and there are some decisions where, let's be honest, you really just need some knowledge. Knowledge to make a good decision. So like sometimes you just need a good YouTube video to figure out how to fix the broken toilet bowl or broken sink. <laughs> but then there's other times when the decision or solution takes, takes a little more than just a little know-how. And it's in those times you need wisdom. You need wisdom as wisdom goes beyond just telling you what to do, but gives you insight into what to expect, into how it could go. Right? See, 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 insight, it's this insight that's birthed really from experience. In fact, can I tell you, this is why Holly and I rarely take parenting advice from parents who have kids who are the same age as Austin. Because while they might look like great kids right now, developing into great adults, like we don't know how it's going to turn out 10 years from now. Like we don't know what your kid is going to look like 15, 20, 30 years from now. No, I want to learn from the, the, the parents and the grandparents who got kids who are like in college and kids as adults who still have a passion and a heart and a fire and a hunger for the things of God. Uh, like the, those are the parents I want to learn from. So, someone who's been a little bit further down the road, who's been there and done that. 
So, so sometimes you just need knowledge. Sometimes you need wisdom. But then, then there's other times you need discernment. And specifically discernment that picks up where our understanding and our wisdom stops. In fact, I like how it speaks this later on, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. It says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things that God has revealed to us by his Spirit. In other words, I think we could best define it like this, and that's that discernment is really wisdom in spiritual matters. Wisdom in spiritual matters. It's, it's this discernment, this wisdom that, that's found, you know, when we kind of hit the walls of what our limits are. Like, I don't know if you know this or not, but your wisdom is limited. And so sometimes we need to have a wisdom and understanding that goes beyond just, just the limits of human understanding. And this is where the Spirit gets involved. And specifically, we're talking about when it comes to the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You know, that, that nudge that, that, that tells you, hey, why don't you, why don't you go pray for that person? <laughs> hey, you know, why don't you go give that person a hug or speak a word of encouragement to that person? That, that push out of your comfort zone to, to go help somebody out in need. That, that confidence and that peace that, that passes understanding when it comes to, to making a decision or in some cases not making that decision. Staying right where you're at. Because while knowledge can tell you what to do, wisdom can tell you how it will work out. It takes a discernment through the Holy Spirit that reveals when to do it. When to take that step. Uh, when to make that decision, when to have that tough conversation. As Look, I know it's the what in our lives that we love to tend to get really worked up about and fixate and, and obsess in when it comes to our life. You know, you know what, what are we going to do with our life? What, what decision are we going to make? Where is this relationship going? But I'm telling you, even more than the struggle to figure out what to do in life, is the struggle to discern when to do it in life. That, that, that's so often behind, I think, so many of our, our sleepless nights and our restlessness in life and worries and anxiety is the struggle around discerning issues of timing. Again, when to take that step. <laughs> when to have that conversation. When to, to make that call or that decision. When is it the spirit that is leading me to do something or say something and when is it just bad pizza from the night before? <laughs> Go on, somebody. In fact, I think there's a great picture of this in, in a passage in John chapter 5. An encounter, um, an account of, of Jesus doing this miraculous work. Uh, and we find it in, again, John chapter 5. And we're going to spend the rest of our time actually in this passage. Because I think it really it gives us some insight when it comes to really discerning God's timing. And uh, so just to kind of set the stage here, Jesus, he shows up to Jerusalem. He shows up at this place that really was well known at the time, known as the Pool of Bethesda. And it was sort of this, this big pool that where hundreds of people would sort of just be gathered around right on the edge of the water. Uh, people with uh, all types of illnesses and sicknesses and disabilities, all hoping for a chance to get into the water and find healing. Because you got to understand, they, they believed this legend of the time that there was something miraculous, that, that there was uh, some kind of magical healing powers in the water. And, and not just healing power in the water, but, but the healing was found in the timing in relation to that water. Because they believed that whenever they saw the water sort of bubble up in the pool, that was a sign that there was a, sort of an angel that was kind of hovering over there. And if they were the first person, as the legend went, if they were the first person in the water, they were the one that would find healing, that the miraculous would happen. And so Jesus, he shows up to the, this pool of Bethesda, he sees you know, a person after person just hoping for their chance, hoping for an opportunity, watching to see if the waters start moving so they can get in the water and experience healing in their life. When out of the corner of his eye, in verse 6, we, we, we see Jesus noticing a man who it says had been lying stuck on a mat by this pool for 38 years. As for 38 years, just doing time, 
having resigned himself to believing that where he was is where he'd always be in life. 38 years, it catches living in resentment. 38 years living with regret. 38 years thinking his time had passed. And so Jesus spots this man out of the crowd and asks him, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Now, for I think a lot of us, we would think the natural response would be, of course, a resounding yes, absolutely. I want to get well. I want to find healing. But instead of responding with this desire for healing, he just responds with all the reasons why he can't. Saying, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. In other words, you understand, Jesus. It's too late for me. I'm always the last one in. There's, there's always someone else seemingly further ahead of me. See, as in his mind, time was working against him. Time was working against him. And listen, I wonder how many of us feel stuck in our lives for the same reason. Always feeling behind. Come on, anyone relate to that? Always feeling like we're trying to play catch up in life. Because somewhere along the line, we bought into the myth that, that early was our advantage in life. That early was our advantage in life. Like the early bird gets the worm, right? That, that you got to be early to do anything of significance or meaning or impact. And, and if you can just get there early, you can get an early enough start on that career, early enough start on that degree. And like if you can get your kid, uh, like I, I know your kid has dreams to be in the NBA, but for that to happen, like, like you can't just start your kid out when they're two with a basketball. Like you've got to start them off at one because every parent knows every great NBA player started at the age of one dunking the basketball. If they're not dunking the basketball by age two or three, it's too late. <laughs> and of course, one of the challenges though, of buying into this idea that early is our advantage is as long as you believe early is your advantage in life. How many know it won't be long until you start seeing being late in life as a disadvantage? As a disadvantage, especially as we age and as the years go by. We're like this man in John 5, resigning ourselves to believing that our time has passed. The opportunity has passed. The moment has passed. Where life becomes about just doing time rather than making the most of the time that we have. And yet here's the good news for us in this passage. For, for anyone who's ever felt behind in life or felt like they were late to the party. Look, you've got to understand that God's timing, as we're going to come to discover, has less to do with how we handle the chronos of our life and more to do with how we embrace the kairos in life. See, one of the, the challenges I think we got to understand when it comes to our English language is, is how limited it is, especially in conveying certain biblical terms or truths in Scripture. Because you got to understand that the New Testament, when it was originally written, it was written in Greek. And in the Greek language, they didn't just have one word for time, they had two. And so, um, so there was the, the, the term, you know, this term and word, chronos, which literally meant like chronological time or clock time. This is the time most of us are familiar with and, and most of us would sort of define our English term for time by. But then they had another word for it as well. Not just simply chronos time, but kairos time. And kairos time meant appointed time. And in fact, kairos might best be described kind of like this. It's those moments where it's where sort of God's what and God's when come together. When there's this clarity around what God wants you to do, the decision God wants you to make, the place God wants you to be and wants you to go to, and the sense of timing, that that nudge, that leading of the Holy Spirit, when they come together, that, that's a kairos moment. In fact, a, a lot of us, we would sort of describe it as, as simply a God moment. When God's what and God's when come together, is a, that was a God moment. And it's important we understand and really, I think, learn to sort of differentiate between these two kind of meanings of time, chronos and kairos, because if your goal, I'm telling you, is just to do more time in life, then yeah, early is your advantage. But if your desire is to make the most out of your time, 
If your prayer is not just for more chronos, but more kairos, not just more years to your life, but life to your years, it's not early is your advantage. It's Jesus is your advantage. He is your advantage. See, see, we're in John 5 and asking this man the question, do you want to get well? Jesus wasn't looking for an answer from the man as much as he was trying to shift what this man was looking to for the answer. Like, I know you keep thinking that the answer is if you were just a little bit closer to the water, if you just got an earlier start in getting in the water, but, but the life that you're looking for, the freedom you're looking for is actually getting closer to Jesus. Getting closer to Jesus. Listen, this is key to discerning God's win, God's timing for your life, those kairos opportunities. As I found that the best way to know God's timing is to prioritize my time with God. The best way to know God's timing is to prioritize my time with God. To, to be intentional about taking time to get alone with him. Because here's what I found. I only hear him when I slow down long enough to really listen to him. As truth is, look, I don't know if you know this or not, but God is always speaking. God is always speaking. He's always nudging us. He's always calling out to us. He's always stirring something or trying to stir something within us, encouraging us. But so often we miss what he's saying. Not, not, because, not because he's not speaking, but because we're not listening. And not because it's an issue with him not speaking, but because so often we're not taking the time to ever really listen. Because again, we just fall into this trap of living our lives based on chronos, where when it comes to getting ahead, we think early is the advantage. And if I can just get an early enough start to my day, if I can get an early enough jump on my to-do list at work, and in our rush to get out the door early, we fail to take the time to just get alone with God, to do not just talk to him, but to hear from him through his word. And look, I get the pushback. I go, oh, Pastor... Yeah, it's easy for you to say, like, what do you work? Like, one, two days a week, right? Which one? I'm a little offended by that. <laughs> but two, um, look, I, I get it, because I think oftentimes when we think of getting alone with God, sometimes we can overthink it. You know, we can make it out to be more than it really needs to be. You know, look, I'm not talking about you need to set aside two, three hours in your morning. But can you set aside maybe two, three more minutes in your devotional time? To, to spend enough time with him, spend enough time in his word that you don't leave from that place till you get something from God, till you hear something from him through his word. Maybe a word of encouragement or a promise for your life. You know, so often we treat our Bible reading like it's just one more thing on the to-do list and we check it off, I read my chapter. But when was the last time you, you, you hung around long enough in that alone time with God that you're like, I'm not leaving until I hear something from you, God. Hear something from you, God. Because here's the thing. I find that, that, that when I, I miss those times, when I, I allow the chronos to lead my life and I leave the house early, look, it's, it's not that God is somehow you know, disappointed in me or like looking down with this discouraged look, like I can't believe you missed out on alone time with me. Do you not care anymore? No, here's what I found is that like, like God knows, God knows my heart. Like he knows I'm not a flight risk when it comes to my faith in him, right? I'm not going anywhere. But I find those days where I miss that time alone with God is also the days where I miss so many, I believe, Kairos opportunities right in front of me. I miss out on that nudge. I miss out on that leading. I miss out on that stirring and that still small voice that he's trying to you know, speak something into my life to set me up to experience and to see the miraculous in and through my life. And, and of course, this is really sort of the, uh, again, sort of the challenge though with this. And this is a challenge really with prayers that, that as we're going to discover in John chapter 5 is that when it comes though to these God moments, these Kairos opportunities in life, because again, I, I, my prayer is that you have the same prayers I got, which is, is I don't want just more chronos, I want more kairos in my life. I don't want to just you know, add you know, more years to my life, but I want to add more life to my years, is that I found that those God moments, those kairos opportunities, 
in, in our life. They, they oftentimes, and that's what we're going to discover in the story, is that I find that the right time for God often seems like the wrong time for us. The right time for God often seems like the, the wrong time for us. As back to John 5, again, look at this, verses 9 through 12, and a little bit of a spoiler alert, just to be clear. You know, Jesus is going to heal him. You know, in case you were wondering, in case you were on the edge of your seat, you know, I know you're shocked by that, but he, he's healed. But, but, but check out what it goes on to say. It says, at once uh, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. See, they had strict religious rules when it came to the Sabbath. Like you couldn't go shopping. You couldn't travel. You couldn't even cheer on the Dallas Cowboys. Man, that, that had to have been tough. <laughs> you couldn't work or do anything that even seemed or looked like work. And so imagine this, 38 years. This guy's been waiting to be able to do away with this mat. <laughs> 38 years he's been waiting to be healed and Jesus seemingly comes on the wrong day of the week. Like you wonder if in the back of his mind he had to been thinking like Jesus could you come just a few days earlier? Like come on a Thursday give me a long weekend you know or come on Wednesday, Tuesday or, or you know any time 30 years before now. <laughs> like why does it have to be at the seemingly wrong day of the week? Why does it have to be the Sabbath? This, here's the thing you got to understand about Jesus and how Jesus works is that Jesus never did anything accidentally. He never did anything accidentally, but there was purpose and meaning in everything that he did, everything that he said, and even when he did those things and said those things. And the timing of this man's healing, I'm telling you, was no different. Reminding us that, that look, if you want to age well with time, where life is more than just about doing time, but making the most of the time that you have. It's going to take having the courage and the willingness to get a little uncomfortable. And to, to be a little inconvenienced. To not, to not just discern God's right timing, but to step into those kairos opportunities in life. When the Holy Spirit, again, nudges you to pray for somebody to serve or to help somebody, to be a listening ear for somebody. Kairos opportunities that I'm just pre-warning, I'm telling you, will often seem to show up at the worst, most inconvenient times when it comes to the chronos of our lives. Opportunities that challenge us to remove the lie that early is our advantage. That early is our advantage because early is only an advantage if you're living for more chronos. But again, I don't know about you, but I don't want just more chronos. I want more kairos. I don't want more, just more years of my life. I want more life to my years. But when you're living for more kairos, you, you come to realize it's not early is your advantage. It's God is your advantage. And when he is your advantage, come on, here's the good news in this. You come to realize it's never too late to experience the miraculous. And when Jesus is your advantage, when he is the difference in your life and in your schedule and in your calendar and in your day, you realize it's never too late to see life turn around. It's never too late to find a fresh start. It's never too late to make a difference. It's never too late to start aging well with time. Come on, somebody. You know, in Proverbs, it actually um, kind of cautions us of living a life that's less than that. Saying this is that there's a way that, that, that seems right to a man, but leads to death. It seems right by the calendar. It seems right by the clock, but leads to death. As look, I want to pray, especially for those watching this, who would have the courage today to be honest enough to say, I've got some things in my life that I've let die. I've got some things in my life that maybe I've given up on. Maybe a dream, uh, maybe a, a pursuit, maybe a prayer, maybe a relationship, maybe healing of a joy for my life. Because I bought into the ways of this world and the lie of culture that would try to get me to believe that somehow my time has passed. Time has passed me by. But listen, if the message of the gospel reminds us of anything, it says, followers of Christ, it's not early as our advantage, 
It's Jesus is our advantage. As look, I really believe this is a Kairos moment for someone right now. A Kairos moment for someone watching this and tuning in today. A moment where God wants to, to, to pour into a fresh fight by bringing some dead things back to life. As you make the decision to not just settle for doing time, but to make the most of your time by living a life that embraces those Kairos opportunities in life, choosing to not just be led by your calendar, but to be led by the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit, responding to the nudge, responding to the interruption, responding to the call to follow Jesus. As listen, if you're feeling that nudge right now, I want to give you the opportunity to step into this Kairos moment that I'm telling you can change your life for eternity. This Kairos moment of choosing to to quit living life on your own schedule and by your own plans and in your own way and on your own terms and choosing to turn. The the Bible describes it as repentance. It just simply means to turn away from doing life my own way and turning to this statement and this action of surrender, turning to Jesus, looking to Him for the kind of life that's found only in Him. Life abundant and life eternal. And so if that's you, if God's nudging you to take this moment, to to not walk away from this Kairos opportunity, but to step into it. If your prayer would be, "I, I don't want just to add more years to my life, but more life to my years. Listen, I invite you to pray this with me. Father, I recognize I've, I made more than a few mistakes. I slipped up more than a few times. But I'm tired of being stuck in regret, being stuck in shame, being stuck in resentment, being stuck in bitterness. But Jesus, I believe you came on this rescue mission, leaving heaven to come to earth, to die on a cross, to pay a price in full for all my sin, all of my shame, past, present, future to free me from the mat, to free me from the regret, to free me from the disappointments and the rejection, to free me to live a life, not just to encounter a life eternal, but even life abundant. I don't want to just do time. I want to make the most of my time here on this earth by living my life for you. As Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and not just be Savior of my life, but to also be the Lord of my life, the Lord of my schedule, the Lord of my calendar, the Lord of my time. I give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 